the Great Manchurian Plague. In March 1911, the broad stream of the Sungari River in Manchuria witnessed a scene of macabre horror. The winter ice was thawing, and as the flows drifted north towards Russian Siberia, they carried with them a cargo of death, black heaps of bodies piled on the gleaming white ice sheets. The dead on floating tombs were victims of a pneumonic plague, the scourge that swept Manchuria for six months, killing 40,000 people and spreading famine and misery over 250,000 square miles. Unable to dig mass graves in the frozen soil and unwilling to waste fuel on burning the corpses, the Chinese simply flung thousands of them onto the river ice, knowing the thaw would eventually carry them 500 miles into Russian territory. Bandit warfare and mass starvation added to the terrors of the Great Manchurian Plague, but the epidemic was also notable as the first occasion in which international medical experts were able to cooperate on Chinese soil. Despite the apathy or sullen opposition of some of the Chinese mandarins, the plague centres of Harbin and Mukden became laboratories where scientists of six nations worked to conquer the pestilence. The villain of the piece was a harmless-looking little animal of the Manchurian plains, the marmot. Every year, about three million marmot pelts were sold to Russian fur dealers for conversion into imitation sables. The centre of the trade was the city of Harbin, since China had granted the Russians a concession to build a railway across Manchuria to Vladivostok, Harbin had become almost a Russian city. It had 20,000 Russian residents, it had Russian churches, banks, factories and railway workshops. The rail line was patrolled by Russian troops and armoured railway wagons. Outside the town and along the banks of the Sungari River, however, was the overcrowded Chinese quarter where 30,000 labourers and small traders lived in a squalid network of unpaved alleys. Marmots were known to be carriers of plague, and for many years the disease had been endemic in Harbin and other towns and villages of Manchuria. What caused the terrible flare-up late in 1910 was never known, but by October 600 were dead in the town of Manchuli, and the infection was spreading rapidly east along the railway line towards Harbin. The first case was reported in Harbin itself on November the 10th. A month later, the death rate on the Chinese quarter was up to 100 a day. The Russian authorities demanded drastic action. A military cordon round the Chinese quarter, cremation of the bodies and wholesale burning of the infected houses, but they met stubborn opposition from the local Chinese governor. As the London Times correspondent reported bitterly, this amiable old Mandarin preferred the plague to foreign meddling and believed that loss of face was much worse than loss of life. He lay dozing over his opium pipe, concocting lying reports for the bewilderment of the government in Peking. He was directly responsible for the deaths of countless of his countrymen. Peking's bewilderment soon turned to panic as thousands of refugees fled from the plague areas, streaming southward by rail and road towards the Great Wall and the Chinese border. By mid-January 1911, the Harbin death toll was 200 a day. Russian and Chinese doctors slaved side by side in the packed hospitals and sent out squads to collect and burn the dead. The Times correspondent reported scenes ghastly almost beyond imagination. The streets reek with the stifling fumes of burning flesh. Famished dogs prowl round heaps of corpses and tiny children cry piteously round the smouldering funeral pyres of their parents. In the Russian quarter, the streets were deserted, but for the few eerie figures swathed in protective clothing, their mouths and noses covered by pads soaked in carbolic acid. The burial squads, attracted by pay of one shilling a day, were often recruited from the worst dregs of the city. They drank the raw spirits given them to disinfect their hands, pillaged the dead, and broke into orgies of drunken violence. The most terrifying aspect of the plague was the speed of its onset, Within a few hours of first spitting blood, the victim collapsed in a coma and more than 90% died in a day. A British missionary doctor reported that 4,000 bodies had been burned in Harbin in five days, but thousands more still lay uncollected in the streets or concealed by relatives in squalid homes. The icy Manchurian winter added to the horror of the situation. Thousands suspected of infection, the aged, women and children alike, were callously thrust from their homes to freeze to death in the gutters. The iron-hard ground made digging of mass graves almost impossible, 
and the Chinese authorities regarded cremation fires as useless waste of fuel. Defying regulations, they tossed the corpses of their relatives onto the ice of the frozen Sangari River, knowing that the spring thaw would sweep them away. Others were buried in graves scraped in the snow to be revealed, littered in countless numbers over the plains, when the warmer weather melted their snowy shrouds. Meanwhile, infuriated by Chinese official apathy, Russian politicians and newspapers were demanding full-scale intervention as the plague spread unchecked towards the Siberian frontier. On January 17th, the Tsar's Grand Council in St. Petersburg ordered the Trans-Siberian Railway to stop all traffic into Manchuria. Quarantine posts patrolled by Cossack cavalry were set up along the border. The first signs of infection had appeared in Vladivostok, they were stamped out by the ruthless burning of the whole Chinese quarter and the deportation of all its inhabitants. Even in far-off Europe, the nightmare word plague brought shudders of alarm. In the great ports of Marseille, Naples, Hamburg and Antwerp, rigid quarantine was enforced on every ship from China. Russia's efforts to seal off Manchuria largely succeeded, but the suspension of all rail traffic in and out of the province turned the flight of the refugees into a mass tragedy. Up until the end of January, the disease had been mostly confined to Harbin and the towns along the railway line. Many of the richer Russians and Chinese had been able to escape by train to Peking, Vladivostok or Irkutsk. Now the tracks were silent and blind panic seized the people of Harbin. They poured out in an endless flood, spreading the infection through every town and village they entered. Some made their way north along the Sangari and Amur rivers to be plundered and murdered by bandits who swarmed over the barren countryside. One bandit army of 100 men butchered as far as the suburbs of Harbin after a Chinese regiment sent against them had been completely wiped out by the plague. Another refugee stream crawled south towards Mukden, taking the sickness with them to the flourishing town of Quancheng, my people are dying at the rate of 300 a day, the town governor reported early in February. Thousands of bodies were piled on a marshy islet in the Sungari River and left to be swept away by the spring floods. In a few weeks, 1,600 were admitted to the plague hospital and 1,600 died. By now, the Chinese government had realised that its own meagre medical service was helpless. Day by day, the plague was approaching Peking and the great cities of northern China. A handful of European missionary doctors were already toiling heroically in Harbin and Mukden. Russia had suggested an international medical commission, and China was now ready to accept world aid. Throughout February 1911, some of the most celebrated scientific figures of the day converged on the stricken city of Harbin. By early in March, the International Plague Commission was at work, and Harbin became a workshop of research. The doctors met fanatical opposition from some Chinese who still hated the foreign devils and treated the plague by exploding fireworks, puncturing the victim's skin with silver needles, the Russians were especially hated. They told how dying patients deliberately spat in the doctors' faces in the hope of infecting them. Rioting mobs burned and looted deserted warehouses in the Russian quarter. Gradually the epidemic was controlled. In the first week of March, 10,000 bodies were collected and burned at Quang Cheng, and 3,500 in Harbin. By early April 1911, the scourge was abated. Spring came to the Manchurian plain. Broken ice flows carried their grisly freight of bodies down the rivers. Melting snow uncovered thousands more. 